Hi, I'm Serena Halstead. I'm Spencer Ziegler. Hi, and I'm Alyssa Smith. And welcome to Data Lit, a podcast for educators by educators. As a reminder, we are interviewing Dr. Gregory Sizek, who is giving us a glimpse into the world of a psychometrician. In this second part, we're going to learn how everyday teachers such as ourselves can become better assessment specialists. So, Dr. Sizek, when we were talking the last time, we looked at the role and unpacking how supportive a psychometrician can be. And as you said, use that word service in service to the work of teachers and in education. And in this session, we're going to look at some classroom focus. So I think in the last time you use words that as a classroom teacher, I don't usually I know I should pay attention to, but I don't usually it's not like my main focus. And, and those words are like reliability, validity, that sort of thing. So we know that your work, you tend to focus on reliability, validity and norming. Can you explain what each of these terms mean and how do you consider them when you're building an assessment? Sure. OK, so first of all, um, let, let me change my my title from psychometrician to assessment specialist. That maybe is a, a, a more user-friendly way to think about um, you know, people that, that do the kind of service that, that we do. We're, we're specialists in assessment, gathering information. So in terms of gathering information, there would be two things that we would really prioritize. The, the first one, uh, and, and these are gonna be very different. Uh, sometimes people say reliability and validity together as if it's one thing, but um, reliability and validity are very, very different concepts. So I'll try and distinguish them pretty crisply. Reliability has to do with the dependability of the information. It, if I was trying to measure something, if I was trying to understand a student's level of, of mastery of the fifth grade math curriculum, I'd want to come to a conclusion that I could depend on. That's a reliable conclusion. It, it's, it's a little bit like if I was to get up in the morning and step on a scale, you know, in my bathroom to check my weight or something, you know, if it, if it said 210 today, okay, that'd be great. And if I said, well, let me just check it one more time. And I stepped back on and it said 37, I'd be, well, wait a minute. This something's, something's wrong here. This, this is not giving me dependable information. Now, if I got on it and it said 210 and I got off and got it back on and it said, to 11 or something, I would like, okay, well, that's, that's pretty close. That's dependable enough. But if it was giving me wildly different information, it, it's kind of worthless. You know, if it said 210 and then 37 and then 355 or something, I'd be like, what the heck is this scale is garbage. I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out. And that's the exact same thing we would do in educational assessment. If, if something is giving us information we can't count on, it, imagine if you gave an EOG or an EOC to a kid one day and it said they were a level five. The next day you gave it to them and said they were a level one. I mean, it was just, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, that, that scale, right, is terrible. Throw it away. Um, shouldn't be used. So we consider reliability, this notion of how consistent or dependable the information is to be like a first main non-negotiable. If we're not getting reliable information, we're not going to the next step. Now, re reliable information then in an education setting, I, I think it um, be boiled down to this. If I was to give this test to the same student under the same conditions, again, like I give it to them once, they came back the next day and I gave it to them again. If it said they were a level four the first day, it darn well better say they're a level four the next day. You know, I mean, assuming from day one to day two, you don't look up all the answers or learn remarkably or something, you know, or forget everything. Um, assuming that the student is about the same the first day as the second day, no more level of fatigue, no more level of anything. If we could test them the second day with uh, Will Smith's uh, Men in Black, you know, erase their memory of the first day, then, uh, you know, they should get the same score. They should get not just the same category, level four, but they should get about the same scale score. From the first one to the second one. And, and psychometricians, assessment specialists, really work hard to make sure that's the case, that we have reliable information. Now, so reliable means consistent or dependable. You can count on it. Let's go back to that bathroom scale. <laughs> and if I got up in the morning and jumped on and it said 37, I said, wait a minute. And I got back on again and it said 37. 
I said, come on, one more time. I got on 37. That would be highly dependable information, but I got to tell you, it would be wrong. Okay. So dependable is good, but it ain't enough, right? We want something that's consistent, but we want it to be consistently right, so to speak. I could design a system of measuring English language arts that would consistently underestimate the the English comprehension of non-native speakers. I, 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 you could purposefully design, and we, no one would, but, but you could have systems in place that sort of consistently were wrong. And, and a classic example of that is reading level on mathematics examinations. We're, we're trying to measure someone's ability to do mathematics. And if you have very complicated, linguistically structured word problems, you might not be getting a good measurement of someone's mathematical problem solving. You, that, that measurement might be tainted because there's a high language load that's irrelevant to the measurement of mathematics. And that student might get a very dependable score. You know, each time they take it, the language is confusing to them or the the linguistic constructions are unfamiliar or something. So they're not able to show their true level of mathematical ability. That would be like getting on a scale every day for me and it said 37. I'd get the wrong result every day. It wouldn't be my true weight, but it would be very dependable. So for the second step in the process, what, what we're trying to do is not just get information we can count on, the reliability part of it. But we want to make sure that that, that that assessment is really measuring that student's mathematics knowledge or skill and not their reading. We want to make sure it's really measuring their reading and not their culture. We want to make sure it's really measuring their U.S. history, not their gender. I mean, it's just like we, we want to make sure it's consistently measuring, comma, the right thing. So it's giving us reliable information that's dependable information. And then the second part is the score on that means what we think it means or what we intend. The, uh, uh, the easiest definition of validity is that validity means the score on the assessment means what it's intended to mean. So if it's intended to mean my level of mathematical knowledge, it means that. It, it doesn't mean my level of English language proficiency. It doesn't mean my reading comprehension skill. It doesn't mean my, my dialect, my region, my, you know, anything like that. It, it means that I have this level of math proficiency. So those two characteristics, one, that the, the process we've designed is dependable. It would give us the same result if we did it again. And two, that the resulting score means what we think it means or what it's intended to mean is the validity part of it. Think back of the softball example you gave on the last episode, you know, identifying these other variables, the headwinds that might yes. make it less reliable day to day, or or perhaps if one kid's throwing in Coors Field and another kid down at sea level, you right. know, that might be making it invalid because it's measuring other stuff like your location. Yeah, the only a tweak I would make to that is that psychometricians tend not to think um, in terms of valid, invalid, okay. but but more or less. Um, mm. uh, you know, some things will weaken our confidence that this score means what we intend it to mean. Some things will strengthen that. So we, we never have like perfect validity. We never have like imperfect, you know, something that's completely not valid. It's it, there's always like assessment specialists or, or gathering information to support what that score means and constantly trying to make it Im improved. Like, like we have more confidence that really does measure your math problem solving or more confidence that really does measure your English language arts. Right. So, right. so yeah, getting rid of that binary. Like you said, last episode, yes. it's about inferences and that's a spectrum, not a binary. Yes. Yes. No. So a question that I have, and I know you've mentioned this in the first episode, a psychometrician is not there to make a test. You know, persons are coming in wanting to get information like, is this fair? 
But I still want to ask, at some point, that information comes up. And so I would like for you to clarify, what measures do you take to ensure that assessments do not unfairly disadvantage a certain group? And I know you've spoken to that, but I would like to hear your take on that. Sure. The, the, that, that purpose, making sure that an assessment doesn't advantage or disadvantage any group, Actually, let me clarify that. I'll come back to this point. Yes. I would like every assessment to disadvantage some group. And I'll tell you what that group is at the end. That'll be a teaser. Well, it's a good teaser. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, the idea of, of building in fairness is really something that permeates the entire process. So imagine we wanted to have, we'll go back to a fifth grade math EOG or something, Right off the bat, someone has to decide what content will be tested on that fifth grade math EOG. Now, if we only brought in the outstanding teachers from Wake County to decide what should be measured, the the teachers from Charlotte Mecklenburg might have a very different idea of what should be on a fifth grade math test. So the 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 people um, uh, on the on the Atlantic coast might have a you know, rural communities in the Atlantic coast might have a very different notion of what's appropriate for fifth grade math than the folks up in Boone or something, you know? So one thing that would be done right off the bat in deciding what should be on this test would would be to gather a group of educators, curriculum specialists, assistant superintendents for curriculum instruction, math coaches, you know, get people who are familiar with what fifth grade math is in their area and get them together to decide what should be on the test. And that that's a kind of a horse trading session, you know? Like some people would say, well, we think this should be on the test. And the uh, large number of members of the group would say, no, uh, we, we, don't, we don't teach that. You know, that's taught in sixth grade where we are or something. And so there'd be some negotiation going on. And eventually through some sort of quasi-democratic process, people would have to agree on what the standard course of study is for fifth grade mathematics. And so right off the bat, there's this notion of what's fair being built in, because it would be unfair for one county, you know, their personnel to decide or one group to decide. So there's some diversity taken into account right off the bat. Then people have to write test questions. Maybe they're essays, maybe they're uh, multiple choice questions, maybe they're designing technology enhanced items, may, whatever it is, somebody's got to write those questions. And the, the people writing questions most often are, uh, well, psychometricians, we don't get involved in that much at all, other than to give people some some training or some information on how to write good questions. It would be typically the educators or the content specialists who would write the questions. So we try and screen out these disadvantaging influences, these contaminating influences by having the people who are doing um, the, the writing of the test questions to be people who are specialists in that area and not specialists in something like psychometrics. So the item writers um, then produce some test questions or some essay prompts and so forth. And then their work is often sent to another group who specialize in reviewing test questions. And those reviews are are three or four different slices of of concern. One is, you know, is it grammatically correct? Is the language clear? All that kind of stuff. It's sort of an editor's, um, English language editor's perspective. Another perspective would be, are the concepts in this question that somebody wrote developmentally appropriate for these kids? You know, is there something in here that is not really going to be familiar to students at this age or at this grade level. Another perspe- perspective would be gender and eth- ethnicity and regional sort of perspectives. Are these fair for all kids, no matter what their home language is, no matter what you know their ethnicity is, no matter what their gender is, no matter what region of the state they come from? People would review those questions to make sure that they're, they're appropriate. And then after those levels um, and each of these groups are sort of trained or or impaneled to provide these different uh, perspectives. After each of those levels, then those those ones that survive, and not all questions survive, right? Some of them get thrown out because they're not 
fair to all students or whatever, and they can't be fixed. So we're going to get rid of it. Um, the ones that survive would go through a, a tryout process. Th this is something I think that many uh, folks in the field don't realize happens, which is every question that counts for a kid on a test had to go through a tryout where it didn't count. No nothing appears on a state test that didn't get tried out to see if it was any good. And so um, the, the, the results of these uh, questions and prompts and essays and things that, that survive the, the reviews of, of those groups we talked about, they then get put as pre-test or pilot test or field test items to get tried out to see, are they in fact really as good as we thought they were? Because sometimes people who are screening for bias or sensitivity or developmentally appropriateness or any of those things, sometimes they miss stuff, right? You can look at something and you're, you're pretty familiar with it and you pass it on, but um, we then actually try it out with real kids under real circumstances and where it doesn't count for them, but ideally they think it does. You know, we want them to try as hard as, as they can on, on every question. We, we try them out to see, does it in fact work the way that we, we, we thought it should work? Is it really as fair as, and is equally good for, for all students as, as we had hoped. And then after those tryouts, there's more statistical analysis. There's a procedure called differential item functioning that's usually used, which um, is a, a very specific statistical procedure to see if a, a test question would advantage or disadvantage members of a, of a group. And we can um, do those sort of statistical tests that would show something we didn't see in a, in a just a, a, a review of it. And then if, if an item has passed all of those steps along the way, it becomes a real test question. You know, uh, I always think of uh, back in the day, there was this schoolhouse rock thing about how a bill becomes a law. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going and I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bill, I'm a bill, I'm a bill. And finally it gets, it gets to be a law, right? Well, that's kind of the same way it, it works with test questions. You know, they, they they plot along through all these steps and eventually they they can cross the finish line and become a, a real item that's used on an EOG or an EOC because they've survived all that screening that's that's happened. I, now coming full circle, some people should be disadvantaged. The group that I'm thinking should be disadvantaged, and this is something that assessment specialists work hard to do, is to disadvantage one group of people. Hmm. And, and that is people who lack the characteristic you're trying to measure. Mm. In other words, if someone doesn't know fifth grade mathematics, I want them to perform poorly. Right. Oh, right, right, right. I don't want any test to just be a feel good, everybody passes. I want that test to really give educators solid information about who knows more and who knows less. Hmm. And if that test doesn't do that, it's not worth giving to students. So the people that should be disadvantaged are people who are, are lacking mastery of fifth grade math, who don't comprehend the reading passage well. After we've controlled for all those things, right? Mm -hmm. First language, um, ethnicity, gender, if we've controlled for all those things and made sure it doesn't disadvantage for those things, the only thing that's left is how much do you know about fifth grade math? How good of a reader are you? And if, if we can't appropriately distinguish between who's got more of something and who's got less of something, then that test is really not very worthwhile. I like it. I like it. Uh, you know, I've written items several times, but I've never thought about it like that. But just as you bring it home, I'm thinking to myself, when we write those distractors, if you're a good item writer, I'm um, writing good distractors, that's what you're really trying to get at to see mm -hmm. who really knows what they're doing. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, you bring up a really interesting topic, maybe for another, uh, yes. another session, which is, how do you write good questions? Mm -hmm. And yes, there should be one clear, best, right answer to a question if it's a multiple choice question. But the other three choices, I like to call them choices instead of distractors, because distractor sounds like I'm trying to fool people or something. Right. Yeah. So, 
I don't want anybody to be distracted. I just want them to get the wrong answer if they don't know it. Right. So, um, but what, what, what should be a characteristic of a wrong option? Uh, an incorrect option should be something that's plausible mm-hmm. and should tell you something about what that student is thinking. Right. Like, um, for example, if I was to ask a student, what's the capital of North Carolina? A good wrong answer would probably be Charlotte. Right. It's a big city. Kids have heard of it. It would tell me something about that student. Or maybe um, that student's hometown is Burlington, North Carolina. Right. Mm-hmm. If I'm giving the test in Burlington, I put Burlington on there because maybe that would tell me that that kid is pretty familiar with their their local context, but they're, they're, they haven't been really thinking about the state as a whole. I might pick some other big city, you know, to, you know, something that would, they, they'd be very familiar with. And it would tell me what the student is thinking. Math teachers are really good at creating wrong options because what they'll first do is they'll, they'll, they'll ask the student to solve maybe their whole class. They'll, they'll give it in an, in an open-ended sort of format and they'll see what really common wrong answers students mm-hmm. come up with. Because oftentimes from the wrong answer, you can tell what they're thinking. We, we call these cognitively diagnostic options. It's a, it's a wrong answer, but it informs the teacher about where they were thinking along that process that led them to that wrong answer. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not a matter of just throwing down three wrong choices. It's it, good question construction has not just a right answer that tells me you learned it, but it's got wrong answers that tell me where you are, you are where you are thinking differently um, or where you are thinking in a way that led you to a wrong answer. I like that. We are definitely inviting you back. <laughs> yes. Before you even said another topic, I was like, this requires another session. And you yeah. just said it right there. So thank you for inviting yourself back with us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know I did that, but you're welcome. <laughs> So yeah, we we love talking to you about what you do as a psychometrician or assessment specialist. Um, but we wanted to end by thinking back to that classroom level. So um, you mentioned you started as an elementary school teacher, correct? Yes. Okay. So if you could get a time machine, all right, you get in your DeLorean, you rev it up to eighty-eight miles an hour, and you go back to when you were an elementary school teacher. Um, what strategies or skills or ideas that you've picked up throughout your career might you tell your former self so that they can have more, I guess, valid, reliable assessments? Okay. So, wow. Um, I, I hope everyone understands your DeLorean analogy. Uh, uh, Melissa Serena, did you too? No, I, know I don't. I'm trying to Google Yes, it. I, I know it. It's from... Okay. Um, Oh gosh! From back to the Come future. Yeah, yeah, back yeah. to the future. Yeah. Yes, uh, we had to get sixty-nine gigawatts through the flux capacitor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, everyone should download Back to the Future and, and watch a very entertaining movie. Uh, Great series. Series. Mm-hmm. So uh, let, let, let me go back, maybe for full circle to this notion of inference. And inference mm-hmm. was that that conclusion that we make based on some limited amount of information. You know, we've given a student a test, we're concluding something about their level of math, knowledge and skill or reading comprehension or whatever. On a, on a state EOG or an EOC, students would take maybe 50 questions. Why do we do that? Why do we ask them 50 questions? Well, because one, if we only ask people one question, Mm-hmm. Your whole score would depend on whether you knew that one thing. Yeah. That seems unfair. The more, I'm going to call a test question now an observation. Mm-hmm. The more observations I can have, if I can observe 50 things about a student, I'm more likely to come away with a confident conclusion or a confident inference. Imagine if I was to, to think about this as an observation. Imagine I was going to observe kids at recess. And I was trying to make a conclusion about was a student aggressive on the playground, you know, and I observed him one time. I I might just say, well, no, they didn't, they didn't do anything. I don't think they're very aggressive. But if I observed them the next day and they were starting a fight and the next day and they were bullying somebody and the next day. So the more observations I could piece together, I could say, well, you know, over these 10 observations, they really didn't, you know, they, they weren't involved in a fight once, but that wasn't very aggressive. Whereas if I had only done that one time, 
and they were involved in a fight, I would come to the wrong conclusion that, that they're an aggressive student. Um, so when we do educational measurement or educational assessment, we want to get more observations, more items. We want to ask people more questions so we can be, be more confident in our conclusion about what they've learned. All right. So an inference then means get more information. That's what teachers should be doing is getting more information about students. I would want to use multiple observations and multiple methods or sources of information. If I was a classroom teacher and I wanted to conclude how much of this last math lesson students had learned, I'd want to do things like give them a quiz, you know, a 10 question quiz. I'd want to ask them oral questions in class during discussions to explain their thinking about some mathematics concept. I'd want to give them a homework assignment that I could check to see, you know, did they learn this concept? I might assign a group project to see you know, how they, how they implemented this in an applied way on some practical challenge I gave them that, you know, that uh, applied the math lesson. I'd want to get multiple sources of information to be dependable and to be confident in my conclusion. The other thing I think I'd recommend is make sure that you're assessing what you think you're assessing. And that's the validity piece of it. For example, uh, as a as a college instructor, I I essentially never have participation as a part of any student's grade. I don't even I don't even use attendance. I know many teachers do, not just at the college level, but also elementary and secondary school. They'll use participation or attendance or something like that. Um, I don't use attendance because, at least in my context, all my students are adults, and I feel like you've got a life and you're going to decide whether you want to come to class or not. And I don't want to, as a, as a teacher, have to judge whose excuse is valid and whose isn't. You know, if somebody says, uh, I want to go to my grandmother's funeral, well, I, I guess that's fine, you know, be absent from class for that. If someone else says, I'm just really stressed out and I needed to take a day off and just stay home and get my mental health together, I, I'm not going to say that's a bad excuse, you know. What, whatever and people are adults, they make their own decisions. So I'm not going to grade or trying to make judgments on people's reasons for attendance. And, and I'd extend that to elementary and secondary education with this notion of participation. Sometimes if a teacher is grading on participation, they might unintentionally be grading on personality. Like True. S- some students Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, you know, and and another student is back there and they're very quiet just because they're shy. They're not going to put their hand up all the time. Sometimes you can make the incorrect inference that the person with the hand up all the time really knows a lot of stuff. And the person who's shy and doesn't contribute a lot doesn't know very much. Sometimes a student who is just sitting there during a discussion with their mouth closed and maybe even their eyes closed, you might think they're disconnected, disengaged, when in fact, they're really being very thoughtful about what you're talking about. You can make the wrong inference from people's behavior. And so I would say be very cautious in terms of those multiple sources of information. You want to make sure that if you're saying a student's not participating, and so you're going to give them a lower grade, perhaps, that, that they're really not participating because they don't understand. You know, that's one reason someone might uh, participate because they don't even understand the question. But you want to know that. So I would want to talk to students individually. I'd want to observe people working in groups to see what each member of the group is contributing. I'd want to call on students, you know, that, that quiet student. I'd want to say, you know, Amy, um, you haven't said much today about this. What are your thoughts on this project that we're doing? And so I'd want to purposefully gather information multiple times, multiple observations, using multiple approaches to getting that information to make sure that the inferences I make are really well supported. 
So this brings us to the end of our two-part interview with Dr. Sizek, who helped us understand better the work of psychometricians and then how we as teachers can employ those skills. As always, if you have questions or comments for us, check us out at www.wcpss.net forward slash data lit. As always, thanks to Jamal Wellman from Worldsville Middle School for our theme music. And until next time, take care. Bye. Bye.